Welcome to church, everybody. It is so good to see you all in God's house. We're glad that you are here. We want to welcome all of our locations, our online and television audience. We're glad that you have tuned in to hear a word from God. Let's go ahead and prepare our hearts by getting our Bibles out. If you have your Bible, take it out. And if you need a Bible, raise your hand. The ushers would be happy to give you one. One of the signs of a great church is when they tell you to take your Bible out. If you ever go to a church and they never tell you to take your Bible out, never go back ever again. How many of you know church time is not opinion time? Church time is Bible time, amen? Hold your Bible up nice and high. Let's go ahead and make this declaration of our faith all together. Say it with me. This is my Bible. It is my primary source of spiritual nourishment. I will read it every day and become all that God wants me to be. My mind will be renewed. My life will be transformed. I will become fully surrendered to Christ. Therefore, I will hide his word in my heart so I can be all God has destined me to be. Amen. Would you remain standing in honor of God's word? I want to give uh, honor to Pastor Brandon for doing such a great job at the 11th hour last week for me. Um, I share with our Wednesday night, I said, our staff is just so wonderful. It's getting easy for me to not be here. <laughs> I'm just playing with y'all. Jonah, chapter number four, if you have your Bible, we are going back to the prodigal prophet, Jonah, chapter number four, and I'm going to begin in verse number one. We are now picking up the story, if you were here a couple weeks ago, from after he was released from the fish. After he was released from the fish, don't get hung up on the fish. The fish isn't really where the story's at. It's everything that happened to Jonah and that God did with Jonah. Jonah chapter four, verse number one says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. And so he prayed to the Lord and he said, ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and a merciful God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. This aggravated Jonah that God was full of mercy. Can you believe? Jonah is one of the only people other than Satan who threw God's word back up in God's face. You remember when Satan did that in the wilderness? He threw the word of God in the face of God to try to get God to do what he wanted him to do. How many of you know we don't use the word of God to manipulate God, amen? Jonah said, God, I, I knew this is who you were going to do. I knew you weren't going to do it my way. I knew if I went to Nineveh, I knew if I preached to those people that you were going to show them mercy, and I didn't want you to show them mercy, God. And then the Lord said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city, and he sat on the east side of the city, and there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord prepared a plant and made it cover up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm. And so it damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and he said, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he says, is it, it is right for me to be angry even unto death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on a plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not have pity on Nineveh, the great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. And then also one other verse of scripture, Hebrews chapter 12, it's the foundation for this series. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number one says, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily ensnare us or hinder us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Today we are returning to our series, Unhindered, where we are learning how to lay aside the sin in our life, which is forbidden because it is hurtful. It's forbidden because God doesn't want our lives to get ensnared and tripped up. But we're also learning how to lay aside not just the known sin in our life, but the things that aren't necessarily sin, but that hinder us in our life. These are the Bible calls weights in our life. And we want to lay these things aside. And the key to laying these things aside, I'm taking my title right from the text, is to look to Jesus. And so my title this morning is Look to Jesus and Lay Him Down. Look to Jesus and Lay Him Down. Look to Jesus so that you can run your race. Look to Jesus so that you don't get tripped up. Look to Jesus so that nothing hinders you in your life. Look to Jesus so that you can accomplish everything that God has designed for you to accomplish. The key is looking to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. And right now we open our hearts for you to speak to each of them in a powerful and profound way. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. you may be seated. Well, up to this point, like many in the new year, our focus has, has been on dropping the weight, not the physical weight, but as I just said, the life weights, the things that, that hold us back, the things that get in the way of what God wants to do in our lives, the things that hinder us. And we've been looking at us, and sometimes it's good to look at you, right? So many times in life we look at everybody else, and we, we know how to fix their life, and we know how, what they should do to get it right, and only if they did this, and only if they do that. But the good good thing about being a Christian is God doesn't call us to look at everybody else's lives, right? The Bible says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And one of the greatest things that you, can, I, you and I can ever do in order to be everything that God's designed us to be is to look at us. And so we've been looking into our lives or allowing the Holy Spirit to look into our lives so that we can lay aside these sins and these weights that stand in the way of God doing everything that he wants to do in our lives. And most believers Believers, most people who love Jesus actually have a heart to want to get rid of the known sin in their life and the weights that are in their life, right? And we have this desire, and by the way, thank God for the desire to want to get rid of the things that shouldn't be in our lives. Thank God for that desire. That desire is evidence, it's proof that the Holy Spirit is working on the inside of you, that you are a child of God. If you feel no conviction whenever you do something wrong, if you feel no conviction whenever you're about to commit a sin, then that means that there's something wrong with your connection with the Holy Spirit because the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. And I found out that as a pastor, most people want to get rid of the weight. They want to get rid of the sin in their life, but sometimes they feel just stuck. There's this, there's this kind of internal war going on on the inside of them. And the Apostle Paul actually talks about this internal war in Romans chapter 7. Listen to what he says in verse number 19. He says, for the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And I find that a law, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh wretched man that I am, I am who will deliver me from from this body of death. And then he says this, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul not only talks about the struggle, the struggle, I want to do what's right, most Christians, right? I want to please God. I, I want to get rid of the known sin in my life. I want to drop the weight in my life. He says, I really want to, but I find myself sometimes doing what I don't want to do. And then he says this, that's not just the struggle, but he said, here's the solution, Jesus Christ. He offers the exact same solution as our opening text in Hebrews does when it says to lay aside the sin and the weight that does so easily ensnare us or hinder us, the key is to look to Jesus. And, but what does that mean, look to Jesus? 
Because uh, it sounds good, but, but Paul and, and the writer of Hebrews both present this as a solution for how to live and run an unhindered life. It must mean more than just physically looking to Jesus. And what it literally means in the original language is to turn from and to focus on. It means in your mind to begin to meditate on everything that Jesus has done for you and I. To begin to focus our heart and our attention and reflect on how he has set us free, how he has empowered us, how he has forgiven us, how he has received us, how he has poured out his grace and his mercy on us, how we has rescued us, how he has paid the price for our sin. It is to begin to focus on and to meditate on. Matter of fact, one of the keys to overcoming anything in your life that is not of God is to pause long enough to think about what you are about to do and then think about what Jesus has done for you. And stuff loses its power in those moments. And so it's from this point of view that I want us to turn back to our Bible great Jonah, none other than the prodigal prophet, the man who ran from God. And I want his story to mentor us into how you and I can look to Jesus because Jonah's story is meant to point us to Christ. Matter of fact, do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse number 40? He said this, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so Jesus himself is drawing a parallel between him and the story of Jonah. Everything, by the way, in the Old Testament, do you know why it's there? It's there to point us to Christ. It's there to show us that we need a Savior. All of the rules and regulations of the Old Testament, you know what they're there for? To frustrate us. That's what they're there for. How many of you know that if you got like two or three rules, you might be able to keep two or three rules? Although, quite frankly, most of us probably even can't keep two or three rules, right? For instance, the Bible says, have no other gods before me. Most of us can't even keep that rule. Say, well, I don't worship idols, pastor. You know, I don't have these statues in my house or anything like that. But that's not what an idol is. An idol is anything that has a higher priority in your life than God does in your life. And most of us can't even keep that one. But the whole purpose of the Old Testament is to give us over 700 laws that we'd have to keep in order to be made right with God so that you and I would be frustrated and say, it is impossible to be made right with God based on behavior. And the purpose of that is to point us to Jesus. Because when you give your life to Jesus, you are made right with God, not based upon what you do, but based upon what Jesus has done. And righteousness becomes a gift that is given to you instead of a performance-based relationship that you have with God. And so it frees us, and the old then is there to push us to the new who is Jesus Christ. And as we come to the story of Jonah, Jonah forces us to look at five things about Christ that I want to share with you. The first thing that he forces us to look at is Jonah helps us to see Jesus' sacrifice. You all know the story before we get to our text for today. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah. He says, Jonah, I want you to go preach repentance to the city of Nineveh. And you all remember who the Ninevites were, right? They're the terrorist nation of their time. They beheaded people. They hung people up in their city streets on poles. They made people who were family members carry on sticks the heads of their beloved that they had killed. This was a terrorist nation of their time. These were people who terrorized Israel in every way. And God said to Jonah, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh and I want you to preach repentance to them. I want you to tell them that if they do not repent, I am going to send judgment upon their city. And Jonah doesn't like it because he loves his nation more than he loves God. He is, he is more interested in what is best for Israel than what God told him to do. Jonah loves his Hebrew culture more than he loves God. Jonah loves his race more than he loves being a believer. Am I, am I talking to anybody right now? 
Because many people get caught up in all of this same kind of stuff today where we put love for country above love for God. I love our country. I think we ought to love our country. But I don't love our country more than I love God. I love being Italian, by the way. Two types of people in this world, those that are Italian, those that want to be Italian. I love being Italian. But I don't love being Italian more than I love Jesus. Right? Jesus has to be first. And Jonah was caught in a connection because God was asking him to do something that was contrary to what he thought was best for his nation and his people. And because Jonah couldn't see the wisdom of God or the goodness of God, what did Jonah do? He did the same thing that you and I do when we cannot see the wisdom of God or the instruction of God being valuable. What do we do? We say, eh, nah. And so Jonah runs in the exact opposite direction Right? He goes to Tarshish instead of Nineveh, runs in the exact opposite direction, gives God the Heisman, tells God, no, I'm not doing that for you. And he finds himself in a dangerous place on a boat headed for a city that was completely in the wrong direction. But God loved Jonah too much to leave his heart in that condition. God loved Jonah too much to allow him to love his nation, his country, and his race more than him, to have an idol in his life. And so God, what he do. He sent this great storm upon the waters to get Jonah's attention. And the storm was threatening to kill everybody else that was on the boat with Jonah. And so what did they do? They went to Jonah and they woke him up and they said, what's going on here? Whose God do you serve? They wanted to know, how in the world do we stop this storm? And do you remember after much coercing, right, because Jonah was asleep, Jonah didn't care that what he was doing was hurting other people. Jonah says this, Jonah chapter one, verse number 12. He says, pick me up, throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. Verse number 15, so they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Now anybody familiar with the Bible can see the parallel between Jonah's story on a boat and Jesus' story on a boat. You remember the story where Jesus and his disciples were in a boat and along came that tremendous sea storm? Here's the parallels. Both Jesus and Jonah are on water in a boat. Both Jesus and Jonah have boats that are overtaken by storms. Each storm is described as extremely violent. But Jesus and Jonah are surprisingly both asleep in the middle of the storm. In each case, the others on the boat come and they wake them out of their sleep and they cry to them that they are perishing and they ask them to do something about it. In both stories, there is a miraculous intervention by God and the sea is calmed. And in both stories, the others on the boat are described as more terrified after the deliverance than they were before. So anybody who is, knows anything about the Bible knows that there is a parallel between the story of Jonah and his boat experience and the story of Jesus and his boat experience. And this is done purposefully and masterfully, which is why, by the way, you can always tell that the Bible is is the handiwork of Almighty God because Jonah and Mark's gospel, which tells the stories, are written centuries apart from one another, yet there is such congruity between the two of them. And so the purpose of it is to point us to something that is extraordinary. Jonah is pointing us to the central theme of the Bible, which is the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. When Jonah says, throw me overboard, that the sea may be calm for you, Jonah was pointing us to the fact that he became a substitutionary sacrifice for the people on the boat so that God's judgment against sin and evil would be stopped. And what did Jesus do? He went to the cross to become a substitutionary sacrifice for you and I so that God's judgment against us for sin and evil would not come upon us. Jonah is pointing us to the sacrifice of Jesus. But I want you to notice Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 says this, verse number 41. He says, the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. In other words, Jesus said, yes, there are parallels between me and Jonah, but don't get it twisted. 
I am much greater than Jonah ever was. And if you look at the comparison between the two, Jonah was cast out into the sea because of his own sins. Jesus had nothing to do with his sins. Jesus went to the cross not for his sins, but for ours. Jesus went to the cross because he had, or he went to the cross for a sin debt that he didn't owe because we had a sin debt that we couldn't pay. Jonah's sacrifice saved a few people. Jesus' sacrifice was for the whole world. Jonah's sacrifice temporarily calmed the judgment of God against sin and evil. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross permanently took care of God's judgment for sin and evil against all who will put their faith in him. One greater than Jonah is here. His name is Jesus. He did all that for you and me. Jesus went to that cross so that you and I would not have to pay the punishment or the wages of our sin and our, of our evil. And clearly, what God is trying to tell us is that when we look to what Jesus did, when we realize he did that for us, he paid that price for us, he didn't have to, but he willfully did it so that you and I can walk free. What happens when we look to Jesus in that way? We lay him down. We lay down that sin. We lay down those weights that, does, that do so easily beset us so that we can run with patience. The second thing that Jonah forces us to do is he helps us to see Jesus' grace. Jonah goes overboard, and he rightfully thinks when he goes overboard, my life is over. But undeservingly so, Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, this is kind of amusing to me. It says, the Lord provided a huge fish. Now, God has a different definition of provision than I have. God provided a huge fish. Matter of fact, four times in the story of Jonah, it says that God provided something. And only one time in the provision does Jonah see it as provision. It says God provided a huge fish. God provided a plant. God provided a worm. And God provided a great east wind. And only one, actually five times, and God provided a great storm or uh, a wind upon the sea. Five times it says God provided, and only one time did Jonah see any of what God did as provision. It was the plant. Because it was that time that Jonah felt, well, this makes me feel good. This is, how many of you know that sometimes what you want and what you need are completely different than one another? Sometimes you are asking God for provision, and if God gives you provision the way that you think you need provision, it will not help you, but it will hurt you. And so God provides not necessarily what Jonah wanted, but what Jonah needed. Why? Because God's heart for Jonah was that Jonah's heart would be fully committed to him. And so the fish that Jonah saw as fatal was not fatal, it was favor. Let me say it again. The fish that, God, that Jonah saw as fatal was not fatal, it was favor. The fish that Jonah saw as death was not death, it was deliverance. The fish was not sent to get Jonah. The fish was God's grace to Jonah. Jonah didn't deserve to be rescued. Jonah, Jonah deserved to be thrown into the sea and to die in the sea, but God gave him something he didn't deserve, a ride in a fish. I'm sure Jonah would have preferred riding on top of the fish, maybe like, you know, in one of those cartoons with a lasso around the fish, you know, riding on it, like that would have been cool for Jonah, but Jonah didn't need cool, Jonah needed correction. 
See, some of y'all looking for cool. Some of y'all looking for, God, just, just, just dap me up. God, just give me something cool. God, just, just make me laugh. God, just make me smile. But sometimes what we need in our life in order to get right with God so that God can dap us up is God's correction in our life. And so the fish, which Jonah saw as something that was fatal, was actually favor. It was undeserved. And isn't that what grace is? Grace is undeserved favor. And Jonah helps us to see dimensions of God's grace. The first thing that he helps us to see is that we do not deserve God's grace. Jonah chapter 2, verse number 3 says, you, you hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me, and I said, I have been banished from your sight. In other words, Jonah is speaking in such a way that I, I realized that I had this coming. In other words, I deserve to be punished. See, true grace is not an attitude of entitlement, but rather is an attitude of deepest gratitude because God has done and is doing something good for us that we really don't deserve. At the heart of grace is an understanding that that was our cross, that that was our place, that that was our death, that that was our punishment, and he took it and he gave to us eternal life and forgiveness and provision and he blesses us despite ourselves. How then if I look to an undeserved grace can I continue to pick up the sins and the weights in my life? Secondly, Jonah helps us to see that God has, God's grace has nothing to do with you and I earning it or atoning for it. We cannot repair or cleanse ourselves from our sins. Jonah chapter two, verse number six, he prays this, he says, to the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. In other words, here's what he's saying. God, unless you intervene, there's nothing that I can do. I'm stuck. God, I can't, I can't tickle the world, whale's belly and cause him to spit me up. God, I don't know what's going to happen. As far as I'm thinking right now, I'm barred. I'm in this place. I'm going to die in this fish. What is the point? The point is for you and I to know that you and I can do nothing in and of ourselves to fix ourselves. We cannot make ourselves right with God all by ourselves, but we need the intervention from outside of ourselves. We need the intervention of heaven in order for us to be made right with God. And that intervention from heaven Heaven is Jesus Christ. He came so that you and I can be made right with God. But then Jonah reminds us of the price of grace. The price of grace. That contrary to our cheap grace theology, Jonah knows or learns in the fish's belly that there's a cost. Jonah chapter 2, verse number 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Now, what's really interesting about this is that Jonah doesn't just pray, and I looked up to the Lord of heaven. He said, I looked up to you, and my prayer went into your holy temple. Why the holy temple? Because in the temple, the holy place, there was something called the mercy seat. And in order for God to forgive sin, blood had to be sprinkled on that mercy seat. And so Jonah, when he was in the fish's belly, is understanding that this grace that I'm hoping that God extends to me is going to cost something. It is going to have to cost blood. Jonah understands or appeals to a sacrifice in order for him to be saved. Jonah is pointing us to Jesus and forcing us to take a look at the fact that the reason why God can give you and I grace, the reason why God doesn't punish us for our sins is because on a cross over 2,000 years ago, Jesus spilt his blood and that you and I are not redeemed with corruptible things, but by the precious blood of Jesus, there is a cost to it. But yet you and I, we have what I call cheap grace theology. Here's cheap grace theology. Well, you know, God just forgives my sins and you know, it's just what he does. As if there's no cost to it. And, and the apostle Paul 
in the book of Romans talks to us about this. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? What is he saying? He's saying if we will remember the price that my sin, your sin, every person who walks in, our sin cost Jesus his blood. If we will remember the price that was paid anytime you and I are tempted to get caught up in a sin or a weight, we'll look to Jesus and say, oh no, Jesus paid too high of a price for me to be cavalier about the way that I live, for me to be cavalier about the things that I do. It cost Jesus everything. And so no, I'm not giving in to that thing. No, I'm not gonna live in that thing. No, I'm not gonna spend my life practicing that thing. I'm gonna come out. And when Jonah realized the cost, notice what he said, Jonah chapter two, verse nine. He said, salvation is of the Lord. In other words, there's nothing that I can do. There's a high price that was paid. Salvation is of the Lord. The Lord then spoke to the fish. And here's what he said. And the fish spat Jonah up on the shore. Can I tell you what happens when you go through teaching moments in life and you come to realize the high price that was paid for you and I, and you understand that grace is not cheap, but it cost Jesus everything. When you begin to understand that price, God issues the command for whatever it is that is holding you back in life to spit you up. When you realize that by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed, the high price that Jesus paid for you. God says sickness spits you up. When you realize that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich, when you realize the high price that was paid for you, God looks at you and says, poverty, spit them up. When you realize the high price that was paid for you to walk free from your addiction and you realize salvation is of the Lord, God looks at your situation and God says, spit them up. When you get a revelation of what Jesus did for you, you run a race without encumbrances and without things ensnaring you. But then number three, Jonah helps us to see Jesus' mercy. Not just his grace, but his mercy. If grace is God giving us what we don't deserve, mercy is God withholding from us what we do deserve. So the well, check this out, is both grace and mercy. The well is both grace and mercy. It's grace because it was safety Jonah did not deserve. It's mercy because it was death averted that Jonah did deserve. In other words, grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is God withholding from us what we do deserve. Jonah has now been the recipient of the good he didn't deserve and the punishment averted that he did deserve. Now that Jonah is finally in that place, God spits him up on the shore and Jonah now is given the same instruction. By the way, God is not going to change his mind because you throw a pity party. You know, sometimes we think we go through everything we go through, you know, I'm strong on God, I'm not going to church now, you know, you did that for, to me, my life isn't going the way you wanted to, so you know, God, I'm not going to pray anymore. And it's almost like we expect that finally after we come through it, you and God have this new understanding that you get to call the shots. And God's like, ah, that's not the way it works. So God spits showing up on shore, and guess what God says? He says, okay, now go to Nineveh and preach repentance. After we've been through all that, Jonah, after we've been through the sea storm, Jonah, after we've been through everybody throwing their stuff overboard because, you know, the, you, you caused that storm in everybody's life, after go spending three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, after all that praying that we did, Jonah, after all this, and here we are again. Guess what, Jonah? Go and preach. How many of you know it's better just to obey? There's so many times in my life when I look, did I really have to go through all that? 
I'm like, God, really, did I really have to go through all that? Did I have to become the prodigal son? Did I have to become the, 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 pity, the pity party throwing prophet? God, did I have to go through all that? Why did I just trust and obey? There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And so Jonah goes, but he goes with a bad attitude. Don't you love Jonah is so, so us, isn't he? He's so us in every single way. And he goes with a bad attitude. He's like, I can't fight you, God, so I'm going, I guess I'm going to do it anyway, you know, type of thing. And he goes there, and he preaches repentance. If you guys don't repent of your evil ways, God's going to turn the lights out in 40 days. But then instead of leaving and saying, God, okay, now I'm praying that the word that you brought me to give comes to pass, Jonah goes up on a hill over the city. And he sits underneath a little shelter that he makes, and he looks, and here's what he's looking for. I can't wait to see God rain down the fire on these people, because I know these people are not going to repent. And you see, what has happened is Jonah doesn't know that before God asked Jonah to do this, God had been working on the hearts of the Ninevites. Matter of fact, when you read history, you understand that there were some things that happened around Nineveh during this time. Number one, in a five-year period, Nineveh had two major plagues. They experienced a solar eclipse, and there was a warring tribe of three different armies 100 miles north of Nineveh that was taking out everything in their way, and they were headed for Nineveh. So by the time Jonah shows up and says, y'all need to repent, otherwise judgment is coming, they know we better get our act together. How many of you know that you don't need to understand why God is telling you do this and do that? You don't need to see the beginning from the end. You need to just understand that even when you can't see him, God is working in your life. And so if God asks you to do something, you need to trust that God is that good that he knows what he's doing. And so Jonah goes there and he preaches and they repent. And, and you would think Jonah would be happy. Now here's this enemy of Israel who has done wicked things, who is no longer going to do wicked things. You'd think he'd be happy. You'd think he'd be happy that he actually went into Nineveh, which hated Jewish people, preached for them to repent, and he got out of their alive. You'd think he'd be happy. But he's not happy about it anymore. And here's why he's not happy. Because Jonah doesn't think Nineveh deserves God's mercy. Look at it with me again, Jonah chapter 4. Verse number one, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord, and he said, ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously from Tarshish. In other words, God, I had every good reason to disobey you. For I know that you are gracious and merciful, God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, oh, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? What is happening? Jonah is suffering from the weight of self-righteousness. I'm about ready to go somewhere. So y'all better strap up and buckle in because it's going to hit some of you hard. Jonah is suffering from the weight of self-righteousness. Jonah thinks he deserves God's mercy and grace because what he did is just a little thing. I just said no to a preaching assignment, God. What's the big deal? He forgot that his no almost killed some people on a boat. Isn't it amazing how we think what we do is not so bad? But God, what they did, God, they are terrorists, God. They can't behead people, God. Clearly, I deserve mercy, but they don't deserve mercy. And Jonah is forcing us to look at us because here's what we do. Well, we're not as bad as them. God, I'm not a liar like them. I'm not a cheater like them. I'm not an adulterer like them. I'm not lazy like them. Or, God, I'm better than them because I got a better career, a better family, better kids, better marriage, more money, nicer house, fancier cars. I, I'm better than they are. I deserve more than they do. Well, let's kick it up a notch. You ready? God, I'm not a racist like them. God, I'm not a baby killer like them. God, I'm not a homosexual like them. God, I'm not a hater of America like them. Look at how quiet it got all of a sudden. 
Look at how quiet everybody gets all of a sudden. Because here, this whole theology of we deserve mercy, but they don't, is a classification of sin where we don't understand what sin truly is. Sin, my friends, of any kind, from the littlest thing to the greatest thing, is a terrorist act against God. It deserves the full punishment of God. Why? Because God is an absolutely 100% holy, 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 holy God. God is not imperfect in any way. Matter of fact, God's standard of receiving people is absolute perfection. It is not flawed in any one. You have to be perfect in order for God to receive you. And that freaks some of you out because you're like, well, I'm not perfect. Exactly. But you are made perfect when you put your faith in Jesus Christ because not only does the death of Christ, the payment for your sin, get credited to your account, but the life of Christ, the spotless, sinless life of Christ gets also credited to your account and you are made right in the eyes of God, not because of anything that you and I deserve. See, there's a weight, it's called self-righteousness. And the weight is, well, I can only love so much because when somebody's morals, when somebody's beliefs are vastly different than mine, then all of a sudden they go in the category of they deserve worse. We can't walk in forgiveness like we're supposed to. We cannot walk in kindness like we are supposed to. We can't walk in seeking peace like we are supposed to because we walk around with a self-righteousness. Listen, our standard is not someone else. If our standard is someone else, you know what happens? We either have an inflated view of ourselves or a deflated view of ourselves. I lost my first game of pickleball ever yesterday. (laughs) Prior to that, I thought I was the best player in the world because I never lost. Inflated opinion of myself. Yesterday I lost. Deflated opinion of myself. See, when we compare ourselves to other people, We're not where we should be. Our comparison is Christ. Listen to what Isaiah said. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. and, And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory and the post of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Do you know what our comparison is? It's Jesus. I'm not better than this one, this one, this one, this one. They're not better than me. But when I look at Jesus, suddenly I realize what perfection is and how short I fall. And it makes me lay aside the weight of self-righteousness and be able to realize that everybody Everybody is a candidate for the mercy of God. And when mercy is shown, it touches the heart. We have forgotten how far we have fallen from. We're in a new age. And the new age is, if I don't agree with you, I tear you to pieces. And we forget the civil rights movement. And we forget MLK. He said this, He said, hate cannot overcome hate. Only love can. He understood the principles of the word of God that we have fallen so far from. Number four, and I'm getting ready to close. Number four. Jonah helps us to see 
Jesus' cross. Jonah's problem is more than a personal one. Jonah's problem is a theological one. Jonah, and I won't read the text again, it's in our opening text, the conversation that God is having with Jonah. Jonah is mad about a plant. God said, you didn't create that plant. You did nothing for that plant. That plant sprung up in one day and died in one day. He said, you're angry about a plant that you had nothing to do with. Don't you think that I should have pity on people that I created? But Jonah is having not just a practical problem, he is having a theological problem. Jonah cannot reconcile the justice and mercy of God. Here's how the argument goes. If God is completely just, how can he forgive sin and not punish evil and wrongdoing? But if God is all loving, how can he not forgive sin and extend mercy to those who do evil and wrongdoing? So Jonah, has, he's in this conundrum between the justice of God and the mercy of God, and he doesn't understand it. And it's a conundrum that people are in today. Many people today are not troubled by a God who extends mercy. They simply want a God who is only loving, winking at people as they do wrong, let everybody live their own truth, and you know, as long as they don't hurt anybody, God's okay with that. That's the God that people want today. But they forget that a loving God God is not necessarily a God who just winks at evil and wrongdoing. Because when you are on the other side of injustice, the last thing you want is for somebody to wink at it. And so there's a conundrum or juxtaposition. Am I preaching too deep or are you getting this? There's a a juxtaposition between God's justice and God's mercy. How do we reconcile the two? How can God pay back evil and wrongdoing, but how can God extend mercy to those who do evil and wrongdoing? And what Jonah is forcing us to do is take a look at that cross. Because on that cross, my God, I wish you would get this. Because on that cross, the mercy and justice of God collided in one epic clash. And on that cross, sin was punished in the worst way possible when Jesus lost his life. But on that cross, mercy was extended to every person who will put their faith in Jesus Christ. And so we see on the cross, the mercy of God and the justice of God work in absolute concert with one another. And it is this beautiful way for God to remain absolutely just and absolutely holy all at the same time. And yet opponents of the faith say things like this, well that is divine child abuse. That God would send his son to die for everyone else. What that is is absolute stupidity of not understanding who Jesus was. Jesus was and is not a lesser being. Jesus was and is not something subservient or someone subservient to God. The Bible says when he was born, we called his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus said, I am the Father. We are one. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus is not some lesser being. Jesus was God himself manifest in the flesh and so on the cross God did not substitute another human being for the sacrifice and sins of everybody else God substituted himself God paid for it himself God extends mercy because it was him that's what Jesus did on the cross on the cross God puts himself where only man deserves to be in sin we put ourselves in the place of God. God says, let's flip that paradigm so that both mercy and justice get met. And Jonah says, look at that cross. And to the degree that you understand what happened on that cross is the degree to which you are able to look at Jesus and lay it down and lay it down and lay it down look at that cross there he hung suspended between heaven and hell for a crime he didn't commit for a debt that he didn't know because we had a debt that we couldn't pay when I look at that cross and weights come into my life I 
I say, no, he paid too high a price for me. When I look at that cross and sin tries to strangle hold my life, I say, no, 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 no. He paid too high a price for me. And on the rare occasion, we ought to preach this a little bit more, it ought to be the rare occasion that we do fall and we do sin. I look at that cross and I say, I don't deserve to be forgiven. But he did it for me anyway because he knew I couldn't be perfect. He knew that I would fall short. So he paid that on the cross. Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Would you stand to your feet? Thanks so much for watching. If this message encouraged you, be sure to join again at one of our many church online experiences live every weekend. Just click watch live in the description below. If you'd also like to learn more about getting involved here at Faith Church, click the connect button. And be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss a single video. Maybe even share it with one of your friends. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, remember with Jesus, you are destined to win.